The questions people have about microdosing versus macrodosing generally are about if one is better than the other for them. This also can include talking about the benefits and drawbacks of each. And especially if you are new to the experience, is it better to start out lightly and work up or just start out heavy? A macro dose is done once and not repeated frequently. Generally, this makes it more likely for a person to experience ego dissolution, connection, and moments often described as spiritual. These can be powerful, transcendent, convincing, and even healing. With, with, with heroic dosings, you know, like you go, you get a hit of acid, or you buy an eighth of mushrooms, or you get a chocolate bar of mushrooms, and there's five grams in it, you know, and people take the whole five grams, or they eat the whole eighth, or they take the whole tab of acid, or they take a massive hit of DMT. Macrodoses have saved my life. As you know, uh, in our previous interview, I experienced really deep trauma as a child. We're talking physical, mental, emotional, sexual abuse, things that I don't even completely understand because the mind has protected me so much that most of my childhood is completely blacked out. So we're talking about that default mode network. How have macrodoses helped with that? Well, I mean, it's really that shift in how I see the world. When you tap into that divine love source, you're like, whoa. One of my biggest um, uh, catalysts for uh, mental health uh, healing using psychedelics was the psilocybin uh, dose that I had of what's considered a heroic do dose. And at that point in my life, I was in an extremely painful situation. I was starting to experience flashbacks from PTSD that I have acquired um, my life, being overly sexualized, being um, constantly having to defend myself due to that aspect of my life and prove myself. Oh yeah, people that are taking heavy, heavy heroic doses, yes. I do have people that are, are that's the only way they do it. Microdosing does not exist in their world. It's heroic dose all the time, ego death every moment. They feel like every day they, get, they gain their ego because they, they're, they're in it. And these people feel like um, they want to shatter that. They don't want to be ego driven, egocentric. Um, that's not everybody though. I have some people that just can't experience it unless it's on a heavy level. And so, I, yes, I do know people that take heavy doses of, you know, Molly MDMA, go to raves and concerts, take LSD, uh, take research chemicals, and they're out there partying all night, dancing, having a great time, and that's the only way they do it. They, they don't think about accessing it on micro levels. It's not beneficial to them. They like the jump. There's some people that are free, you know, it's like a free base jumper, you know, somebody jumping off of a building. That's some of those people, that's their motive, that's their drive, that's their healing. You know, my opinion of that today might be different than my opinion of that tomorrow. It's really about my anecdotal and my scientific evidence that I'm looking at. A lot of scientists get a little irritated by me because I am all about those macrodoses. Like, don't even talk to me about microdosing. Why? Well, because where I want to play, where I think the work needs to be done is in shifting consciousness, like really rattling that brain, letting it reframe, question the things that you know, question what society has taught you. Now with microdosing, you know, I see that more as like, okay, we're, we're taking a drug every day. It seems like a lot of pharmaceuticals to me. It's the hot topic right now, like microdosing, microdosing. A lot of people are experiencing, you know, really good anecdotal, you know, evidence. And that is great. Is it a placebo effect? It might be, or it might be that you're just forming a better habit and you're proud of it. You know, you're like, every day you're consuming it. You know, it's a, like a ceremonial practice and you're like, wow, I'm actually committed to something. Now where I'm concerned with microdosing is where is the long-term data? It's not there right now that I know of. If you look at the clinical studies, if you're watching the timelines, there is not enough data to say that it's not gonna be detrimental to the mind or to the neurochemistry. That's what we're trying to really use psychedelics for, or at least I am, is to change the model up. Why are we trying to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result? Everyone's disorder is different. It's so person to person dependent. 
Although I have my somewhat stance right now on the macro versus the micro dose, these people can easily convince me that I'm wrong. Just let, show me the data. <laughs> I've known people that have done these heroic doses and stopped drinking, stopped smoking cigarettes, changed their complete personality. I knew a lady that was completely angry about everything in life and took a heavy, heavy dose of DMT. 20 minutes later, she came back and said that she seen who she was and she won't be that person again. And she's God honest truth. Four years later, she's a very, very different person. Once a week you know? is a lot. Once a month is still sort of a lot, depending on what phase of your, your life that you're in or what you're going for. But, you know, I think most people maybe would say, you know, a few times a year or once a year or something for, for the macro dosing. But, you know, it's not particularly harmful, so people can kind of do what they want but most people I know they you know when I see them they're not like oh I just ate some mushrooms very often you yeah. know you know like occasionally they, they do but you know usually it, it's when I run into people that I know that use mushrooms they're, they're not on mushrooms the effects of psychedelics are dose dependent high doses are more likely to induce mystical experiences than low doses a microdose is done frequently and is more like a therapy or a vitamin. Theoretically, this can still provide a shift in perspective, but without the physical impairment and anxiety surrounding the stronger experiences. Microdosing was more of, you know, you gotta, when you do those heroic doses, it's a huge space that you have to block out of your life. Something like 12 hours of your day is, is gone, uh, you're gone, cognitively not there, you're gonna who knows where you're gonna be? Everybody's different. You know, some people feel like they transport outer body experiences. Some people feel like they, they talk to themselves inside and they sit at a table with themselves and they have a conversation. Um, some people fall into colors, completely melt into colors. When they come back, some of them don't feel like it was much, it was a great experience, like a roller coaster ride. They're like, wow, that was fun. It was damaging. You know, set and setting was always the most important thing. We've learned that with Timothy Leary and you know, all the studies they've done in the 60s with, with psychedelics. The quality of one's set and setting can often make or break a psychedelic experience. You can't just, you know, come out of a, a bad relationship and a car accident and run over a dog and then take some of these heavy doses of psychedelics. You're going to have a bad time. You're going to deal with some things you just don't want to deal with. So set and setting is very important. You know, a lot of people notice that when they take psilocybin mushrooms or any of these tryptamine uh, hallucinogens, LSD, DMT, they feel better the next day. You know, they feel more relaxed. They feel more mentally healthy. It's been phenomenally great. I mean, I still go hiking and I'll eat a quarter gram of mushroom and it, it's psilocybin or I'll take uh, a very s small dose of LSD and it's very very minute. When you take a very small amount of the LSD, it turns, the megapixel thing turns on, you go from three megapixel to a hundred megapixel, everything is very fine and tuned. There's no tracers, colors aren't changing, things ain't changing colors, it's not, you are not tripping, you are just focused. The data is limited, but reports from individuals participating in studies stated they experienced feeling more appreciative, observant, grateful, and creative. There is also some theories that suggest the daily exposure to smaller amounts of these chemicals frequently over greater periods of time provide healing that less frequent high dose exposure does not. Microdosing is really popular right now. You know, I notice if, if I take a larger amount of psilocybin mushrooms, then I feel better the next day. Um, but, you know, in that time, it can be a little bit of a difficult experience. And it isn't always, but often, you know, for a couple hours, it's, it's not all pleasant. Um, I've also tried just taking really tiny amounts of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, so when, I'll, when I do that, I try to take an amount where if I was to take twice as much, I would feel some sort of buzz but I don't feel anything directly. And I notice I get you know, real similar differences in the, ne in the following days from taking these like, really tiny doses. So I notice that you know, even though I'm, I'm not feeling you know, trip B, I don't even feel anything directly, um, they definitely affect me. I feel more mentally healthy the next day. So you know, a lot of people kind of scoff at microdosing, but I think it really works. There is also danger of doing this too often. 
So there are various theories on the size and frequency of the dosing for different people. Most commonly, a microdose is anywhere from a tenth to a twentieth of the minimal macrodose amount. I don't microdose. I generally macrodose, and uh, because of access, you know, it's hard sometimes to get a to get a supply of this thing that helps me get through the day. And as far as, you know, microdosing versus macrodosing, when I've had a lot of access, you know, uh, it's microdosing has been so positive. It's like having an umbrella from the emotional pain that bothered me and bothered, you know, made me lethargic and made me depressed so often. It, you know, it's all the positives of taking an antidepressant, I, antidepressant with none of the negatives. Like you can microdose LSD and your dick still works. It's crazy. The heroic dose for me, kind of like channel. I feel like it. I, I plug myself into the universe. It's kind of weird. It's like the Matrix where he unplugs the thing out the back of his head. It's kind of how I feel on heroic doses. You kind of either you're plugging in or you're unplugging. It's it's, it's this heavy, woe experience of dropping in and dropping out. And that's, for some people, that's very fearful and scary because you lose a lot of motor skills. Your subconscious is kind of driving now. And so you find out if a person has malice intentions, they can be kind of like a Dennis the Menace. And you can get people that, you know, not really, I haven't really seen anybody get rageful at all, but I have seen people get, you know, get on people's nerves, pick on people, push buttons. You know, that kind of comes on people. That's what really happens with heroic doses. You kind of unlock your subconscious and you have no control over what is the subconscious and what is really happening. So you're kind of like in this, to me, I feel like other people have also, I've recognized it with them, that the heroic doses is more of a switch off and turns on the internal drive. But we're not in that space anymore. We're, we're in a respective space of people trying to live their life, go to work. And so the heroic doses just doesn't make sense. You know, sometimes a person will take a week off of work on a vacation. Like, hey man, my first week of the vacation, I'm, I'm taking, I want to take a bunch of mushrooms or I want to take in a huge dose of LSD or something like that. For, and then the rest of the week, and just, I, don't want, I don't need to do anything for a while again. I feel like that has a lot of, you get a lot of release. You release a lot out of you. A lot of, I feel a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of angst, a lot of, oh my gosh, is this going to happen? Like, I feel like it just washes that all away. You get to start fresh. Uh, the pieces aren't all mixed up and confused. It's a brand new Rubik's Cube all put together, and you, it's up to you if you want to start moving it around. That's what I feel like a heroic dose is. The microdose made a lot more sense to me in my daily activities on who I wanted to, who I wanted to better myself for, myself. And that was not being in this heroic dose space where I'm seeing tracers or the walls are vibrant or melting or things are feeling awkward and weird. No, I wanted to be in a space to where Maybe if I just accessed a little bit of this, it would entune me to where I needed to be entuned. <laughs> but, you know, the happiness that I feel, um, whether it be macrodosing or microdosing, is, is so different, you know, and, I, and I've tracked it. And just the, the way that it makes problems feel like water, you know, you, you suddenly, at least in my experience, I'm, I, can't, I can ignore the small stuff. One distinction that was made pretty clear to me when I started doing this film was that the term psychedelic carries with it some baggage. There's people who believe there's some sort of a conspiracy associated with the term psychedelics and a movement to manipulate youthful minds and to control people. You know, as a scientist, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make sure that the masses are able to hear this message and they can have access safely to this sacred medicine. It's not only about research, it's also about building the proper framework to make sure that the psychedelics, when they are cultivated, produced, whether they are synthetic or naturally occurring, is make sure that there are no contaminants. Make sure it's safe because this is a nascent renaissance and any little slip up is going to spook the horses and is going to be used as ammunition against this movement. And I really wish 
I can say it's for everybody, but it's, I've learned over the years it's not. Some people have taken these experiences and said that they've talked with God or they are God or they are a God now and people get really ego, ego driven. It's supposed to be ego death. It doesn't help everybody and that's what I've learned. And it, it, that's why there's got to be a community of these people to understand and that you hear honest context because there's so much dishonest context out there. And there's so many crazy stories. And this isn't the 60s anymore. People are cooking LSD in their kitchen and you're taking some weird stuff, but there's a lot of weird stuff out there. And there's a lot of research chemicals that isn't LSD. There's a lot of stuff that's going around that's MDMA and MDA and it's not. There's a lot of stuff going around that's like, you know, that the, all these ketamine and, and ibogaine and there's stuff that people are, are accessing now that are finding a lot of medical benefits for but they're not using it with the proper support or even context or you know I it's really hard to facilitate an understanding especially when you don't know a person's entire background because that's what I really feel like you deal with the most is the personalities when you're dealing with psychedelics the personality is going to fully come out and you know again at this point in my life I'm okay with that I think that this is the time when this is the only way to really get the message across. The more of us that come out of the psychedelic closet and talk about the incredible potential that these substances have for our future, for our connectivity, for getting us out of isolation, for getting us truly pay attention to how we treat mental health these days, the more chance we have of getting the consensus and getting some of these things decriminalized and stop prosecuting people for the choices that they make for their own mental health. That was funny. I was just telling someone this. I was, you know, my first time doing shrooms, you know, you got to go through those weird experiences where you have a quote unquote bad trip or something. You know, but, uh, you know, you, I was young and dumb. And someone had straight up my friends and said, hey, uh, we got free tickets to Disneyland. If you can get us a half ounce of shrooms, we'll all do shrooms and go to Disneyland. And we're like, all right, let's go. <laughs> and like, I was probably maybe 18 or 17 at the time. And it got to the point. But towards the end, I told people, man, I went on a, a it's a small rule then. That's where the bad trip hit me. And I started like, we're going on the ride. And then I just saw, at the time I just felt the vibes. I felt weird, I felt creepy. And I got sick to my stomach. I heard a speaker blown out and then it just, and I heard, eh, it's a small world. And it, it blew my mind and it made me so sick. I wanted to throw up and everyone was like, oh, Dre, Dre, chill out, chill out, Dre, Dre, chill out. And uh, a little bit, I got off that ride oh good, but, um, that was like a worst experience. And I, you know, I had many other weird experiences on mushrooms, but um, yeah, you know, obviously uh, when I was young, I was just um, kind of just doing more recreational. I've certainly had terrifying experiences on Salvia. And, you know, after like half an hour, I was fine and very relieved that it wore off. But, you know, people generally do return, but not always. And that's the not always is like people have schizophrenia. Um, a lot of times it'll trigger a long-term schizophrenia episode. And it's not common. I don't actually know anyone that it's happened to, but you know, I've heard reliable reports that you know, long-term mental health issues can be triggered by drugs. It's just really, I think, you know, the, the opening Pandora's box. I've heard patients talk about, oh my gosh, what if I have this psychedelic experience? And then I realize that I don't love my husband. I need to have a divorce or what if my mind is completely changed and you know I have to yeah make a significant life decision that's really scary because it's getting them outside of their comfort zone physically it's really scary because for a lot of people because there are a lot of people that are not used to even consuming cannabis they have no metric for what's about ready to happen and so that's where the education really comes in well you know the psychedelics have very diverse effects and they're not all pleasant uh, you know usually on average it's pleasant but you know in pretty much any psychedelic trip you'll have some good feelings and some bad feelings you'll think about something you did 10 years ago that was really stupid and maybe kind of get depressed and beat yourself beat yourself up over it whereas normally you know if, if i hadn't taken it i would just i remember it but i wouldn't like it wouldn't like get to me so much um so certainly um you know there's all sorts of positive and negative aspects of it yeah a lot of people think that it could be fatal even some people that don't think that it could be fatal they know that they're in a safe space sometimes they jet off to this point where they think that they are dying 
and that is scary. <laughs> but then you come back down from hyperspace and you're in this cozy spot with your psychotherapist that loves you or your friend or whatever. In my experience, I don't have a lot of bad trips. When I spend time in the woods crying and lost, uh, I feel like I get something good out of it at the end. You know, I'm purging out bad feelings, but hanging out with your friends and you know, 10 friends taking 20 hits of LSD and walking 30 miles through Seattle can be one of the best nights of your life. Or taking a, you know, microdosing with your brother and going, and going camping can, making shadow puppets on trees can be, make a better memory than spending a bunch of money and going on a vacation. And, you know, I can't say that about alcohol or even marijuana to enhance any situation with just a little bit of a very cheap, harmless drug is, you know, undeniable. Uh, it's, it's changed my life. It's made things more fun. It's given me better memories than anything that I can, anything I've bought with more money, to be honest with you. <laughs> a lot of the people seeking out this medicine are doing so because they are damaged in some sort of a way. And many people are damaged chemically in their body. There is systems and things that are not working the typical way. And ingesting chemicals, especially large doses of these chemicals, it could really have a negative effect. So you gotta be careful. It's not for everyone. And then, you know, sometimes people take too much and they can't really uh, function so much because they're maybe at a party or they're, you know, out in public and they've taken too much and they need someone. And I've I've helped, definitely helped people who took too much, both, you know, psychedelics and or took too much alcohol and they're, you know, not able to really safely interact with the outside world. And sometimes you just got to sit with them for a few hours and until they uh, come back to reality. No one would argue that psychedelics change your brain forever when you take them. I always heard that when I was in high school. What I didn't realize is that they actually change your brain for the better. At first, I was kind of skeptical of that, but it seems like they really do. Um, you know, people that have taken psychedelics, it doesn't automatically make them a better person or anything, but people that have taken psychedelic mushrooms, you know, especially more than a handful of times, they seem to have a lot more respect for nature. In some cases, respect for other people, but mostly respect for nature. So all of a sudden they pay more attention to all of the plants and mushrooms and animals, everything, everything in nature. They don't want to see logging. They want to live more in harmony with nature. And I think that's a pharmacological aspect of the, the tryptamine alkaloids is that they make people you know more uh, connected to nature more at peace with themselves and, and nature and that's a long-term change and you know when you stop taking the drug those feelings don't go away it definitely changes people um, in a positive way um, I haven't seen anyone take psychedelics that got changed in a negative way but obviously there's going to be some people who will I mean it's they're powerful definitely it's scary as a woman, you know, like a female scientist, a lot of times we're not heard. In fact, the fact that a lot of things that revolve around the work is still illegal, you know, what does that mean for my freedom? There's this stigma out there that people say there's bad trips, and I have never experienced anything bad on taking psychedelics. Of every experience I've had, there might have been things that I saw of myself that I wasn't really liking at the time, or maybe I wanted to change. But then at the end of the experience, I was very positive and like, I can do this and that's not gonna be my problem anymore because now I see it and I it's there and I can't avoid it, so I'm gonna get over it. Also, one of the things we kind of talked about was that there are negative experiences and the general consensus is that even the negative experiences provide learning that could be helpful. But I've also seen plenty of people that have done these things and it was a harmful experience. Maybe eventually it got better for them, but sometimes these things can interact with other medications. They are not for everyone. It's important to really do a, a healthy self-assessment if it was possible 
for people to have a medical professional examine them and determine if this drug that they want to do could be harmful to them before they do it, that would be extremely helpful. In my mind, there's no bad trip. If you listen to Bill Richards, he says that, you know, you need to dive into the eye of the monster and that's where you'll find healing. Or if you look at Rosalind Watts, who, you know, is leading the Imperial College trials, you know, she talks about the ACE model. You're first going to accept, connect, and then embody. It's the same thing, dive down, get the gnarly oyster, crack it open, look at the pearl, bring it back to your life. For the person that is maybe not as knowledgeable or experienced with psychedelics, what I feel like their bad trip would be just something where they're not prepared correctly for what they're about ready to experience. And it's really scary because it is so far from what they expected. And that's where we get into set and setting, you know, first getting the mindset ready. Okay, there's some preparation. This is what you're going to potentially experience. This is what a lot of people experience. You might not, I don't know. And then the setting, you know, is so important because, you know, you want to be in a safe place. That's why I like to consume psychedelics at my house. I feel safe there. There's a lot of ketamine clinics being built that are very luxurious and you feel safe. And then another way to mitigate this quote unquote bad trip is to have someone there that you trust. Whether they are guiding you or they're very passive where they're just like, I'm going to make sure nothing bad happens. You know, if someone knocks on the door, I'm gonna say, hey, it's okay. I mean, that's a big part of the ego to solution. You know, it's where we've built this comfort zone that we reside in. And within that comfort zone, we have a lot of uncomfortable things that we're experiencing. A lot of, you know, psychiatric uh, disorder symptoms. Despite the contrary perception of much of the public, psychedelic drugs are not addictive and are physiologically safe. There have been no known deaths due to overdose of LSD, psilocybin, or mescaline. However, risks do exist during unsupervised psychedelic experiences. But also, you know, the drugs are pretty helpful for a lot of, uh, a lot of mental health conditions. So it's really hard to know whether you should recommend that somebody who has maybe bipolar um, should they take these mushrooms or the, or the LSD or DMT? And, you know, some people that have it, you know, say it really helps them. And other people say that, uh, you know, no, it is not good for them. And, you know, I think maybe it helps, um, definitely it helps more people than it harms. But, you know, with something so powerful, it's going to have all sorts of diverse effects if enough people take it. Psychedelics are thought to induce a hyperplastic state where neurons more readily form new connections, allowing for deep learning. This makes the brain more receptive for new patterns of thinking and can especially be helpful for people suffering from psychiatric disorders. Just seeing my own path of how called I was to engage in psychedelic healing after I have spent years and years of meditating, implementing wellness, mindfulness techniques into my life, it almost became a natural progression. It almost, after doing all of that for five, 10 years, and then taking psychedelics, I realized what kind of the accelerated healing we're able to achieve with taking psychedelics. Not all of us have the time and the ability to take all of these classes with the experts who are teaching us breathwork techniques and meditation and yoga techniques. Not everybody is capable of taking that trip to Thailand and Bali or even Costa Rica or Peru and having a profound psychedelic experience. So one of my goals is to do whatever I can with my advocacy and education to ensure that these substances become more available to people at the lower cost, at, at just, a, you know, in an easier manner, in a more comfortable manner. It doesn't always have to be a clinical setting or a completely recreational setting. There are many, many ways in between to implement these substances in your own healing. A lot of people, you know, are addicted 
to alcohol, tobacco, or you know, food, anything. And when they take these, it kind of switches off the part of their brain that causes the depression. And the depression really drives uh, so many different addictions because people will, you know, they, they feel depressed so they'll eat food or they'll drink a whole bunch of alcohol or, you know, whatever substance or thing, you know, gambling, whatever it is, you know, a lot of that is caused by depression. And depression is just so common uh, and probably always has been. Um, so people notice that the depression just kind of goes away and they don't feel like they need you know, to, to gamble, to smoke, to drink, to do uh, a lot of these self-destructive things um, after they take the tryptamine hallucinogens. So there have been so many times where suicidal ideation, if you want to look at the documentation, started when I was in kindergarten. Most kindergartners don't even understand the concept of death, let alone suicide. That's where I was. There were no plans on continuing to live. I was just ravaging my body, doing really harmful things to myself because who cares? You know, I received the message a couple times. I had a beautiful experience with psilocybin producing fungi where I tapped into the love source and I was just like, wow, everything is so beautiful and what am I doing to myself? But because of the deep indoctrination and fear and that guard dog. I was so anti-religion because I was so traumatized by religion that I was not willing to accept spirituality into my life. So I was like, whoa, no, let's not go there. So I received the message and then I went right back to hurting myself. Then I got to the point where one night I was just so done with the pain that I just, I was like, okay, here's the time, you know, let's go. And so I, at this time I was very methodical, basically got all my finances in line, the best of my ability so my family didn't have to deal with a mess, packed up all of my belongings, um, I found homes for my pets, and here we go. And so that night I started to first, you know, sedate myself and then started to administer a lot of substances into my body. And basically I know at what state or I assume to know, you know, where that point is where you enter death. So we were going that route. And then my mind and my body was just all over the place to the point where I tapped into some, got some LSD out <laughs> and popped some tabs in my mouth and boom, I was back to watching the divine love source. And it was all around me and she was hugging me. It's like, what are you doing? Really that experience was, you know, the closest to intentional death in my life and the LSD really saved me. They definitely shouldn't be illegal. We shouldn't have police going around looking for people that have certain mushrooms and putting them in jail. That's just a, a terrible use of tax dollars and a terrible waste of time and you know, very unjust too, because they're not helping anything. They're just throwing people in jail with all the other criminals for something that should not be criminal at all. So I think the decriminalization is very important to remove criminal penalties. Um, I also think that psilocybin mushrooms have a lot of medicinal potential, and that means that doctors should have access to them. So they should be able to prescribe them for their patients, because there's a lot of medical conditions, uh, psychological conditions especially, that can really benefit from psilocybin mushrooms. And right now the doctors don't have that molecule in their arsenal, and they really should, because it's one of the most powerful molecules out there for depression and addiction. I think it's a way out. I mean, I was, I broke my back and they had me on Vicodin for a few years and I got hooked on them and it was a terrible downslide. And I remember those years and they weren't good and they weren't positive. And, and in that, I really feel like uh, I, can, I can understand where people get lost in that, because the pain that I was in, I was told that these medications were gonna take away the pain. And I didn't really feel like it took away the pain. It kind of made me feel like I enjoyed the feeling and I wanted the feeling, I needed the feeling, the energy boost he gave me, all these things. But then I realized it was tearing up my body on the inside. I was moody and bipolar and I was angry and I had all these terrible, you know, stomach problems and I wasn't sleeping well. And, and I just started thinking like, wow, this isn't, this isn't good. And, and I remember when I was younger, this was when it was in my mid, you know, late 20s to mid 30s when I broke my back and 
all this stuff started happening. And so I was like, wow, man, uh, I should start taking these psychedelics again because it pulled me out of taking those things. Cause I was like, man, this, the doctors keep telling me I have to take these medicines and I didn't want to. I was in pain, physical therapy wasn't working. And they're like, well, take these opiates. And so I started taking the opiates and I started realizing that I started meeting people that want to buy my opiates at the pharmacy, excuse me, at the pharmacy, getting, picking up my prescription, I'd have either somebody working behind the counter after, hey, are you selling any of these? You want to, you know? And so it was like, wow, it, it blew my mind away. And then I started, you know, there, there's, there's communities in these things. And I started meeting people. And I started finding out that people that were hooked on heroin, some of them started with a prescription of Vicodin or Norco from a doctor or toothache, a, a dentist visit, a, you know, a broken back or a sprained muscle or, and they got prescribed this, opi this, this opiate and then the prescription ran out. And then they found out, they start buying them on the streets and they're paying quite a bit of money for these pills. And then some of these guys were like, well, why don't you just do heroin? Because it's a quarter of the price of what you're buying for these pills. And unfortunately, that's what I learned what happened when I was living in Washington, the Seattle, big epidemic up there of opiates and heroin. And that's when I met a couple of people up there that was their same story also. Like, man, this lady, she, you know, had a root canal and they gave her Vicodin and Tylenol codeine and she just enjoyed it and went down this terrible spiral and now she's slamming heroin under a bridge in Seattle and it's terrible and how it, it progressed itself to that and so me getting sick and all this personal stuff that I went through with them saying I had stomach cancer and I started changing my diet and really looking internally at myself and being accountable of my steps of what I was doing psychedelics make more sense of that it's not a it's not an escape it's more of an internal understanding of what you've done and who you're about and so it changed my whole my whole perspective but I was already in that space because I grew up seeing I knew where I was going taking these opiates I was seeing these people that were getting on heroin I, I knew that if I stayed on this path it wasn't going to be a well one so I suppose that means that it should be prescription in some form um, but it should also be legal for people to grow at home or pick because you know just sending the police after these people that have psilocybin is completely counterproductive um, I also don't think that people should have to resort to the black market because on the black market, you know, you don't really know what kind of mushroom they're selling you. You don't know if it's been adulterated. You don't know if it's grown in good conditions. You don't know if it's gotten moldy in storage. Um, so I suppose that means that they should be uh, legally available so people don't have to go to the black market for that sort of thing. And of course that brings all sorts of problems with uh you know just all, all sorts of issues but i you know either they're legally available or they're illegal and people got to go to the black market that's our only two options so i don't think the black market is a good option don't really want to see them in stores but i'd rather see them in stores than people you know buying them from people they're selling like all sorts of different drugs and they happen to sell mushrooms too because they'll sell anything that's illegal that's not really productive to be funneling people into the drug dealer market to be able to get them their medicine. Completely respect it. Context, set and settings, make sure you're always in a safe space. Uh, good fruits and, and, and edibles, uh, water, always keep yourself hydrated. It's a very important thing, keep yourself hydrated. If you're gonna take a heroic dose, contact somebody, let them know that you are going to go through this heavy experience and to not so much babysit you, maybe you can, it'd be nice if you had somebody to watch you. Um, but, you know, just so somebody could check in on you, make sure you're all right. You know, that's, that's the main thing because nobody's died per se of taking these things, but people have done things to really hurt themselves or others. And so that's very important of set and setting, understanding yourself and putting yourself in a space where you're not gonna hurt yourself or others. I've defined my life's purpose and it's one, I am working to destigmatize the use of psychedelics, provide a lot of solid data points. Also, I'm working to normalize mental health discussion. I'm sharing my story. I'm not afraid. I'm actually really proud. Here I am now. I'm still alive. I'm full of love. Uh, I was forged by fire. So I'm not letting the big dogs push me around anymore. I'm up there and I'm spreading love. And so here we are, I'm bouncing around, pollinating as much as I can. You know, I travel around and spread the message of what I think is the truth from my own experiences and just being a loving person, spreading the message of psychedelic healing.
if there's a medicine that can help treat addiction, that's really good um, because addiction is like a really common problem and it's really serious. You know, so many people go through their lives addicted. Like probably most people go through their lives addicted to something. You know, most of that's caused by depression. So if you can make people not so dependent on their addictions for their feeling of well-being um, and, and really treat them, I think that would really resonate w with a lot of people, even, even very conservative people will um, you know understand addiction and how destructive it can, can be for people and society. None of these drugs work like a magic bullet where you just take the drug and then miraculously you're healed from whatever problem it is that you're suffering from. Generally the experience is that you take these drugs sometimes it's once sometimes it's multiple times but there's a learning experience that comes from it. And in that learning experience, you figure out how to better cope with these problems that you're dealing with in life. I started consuming psychedelics and a lot of different routes of administration when I was still a minor, you know, probably around the middle school age. And I can tell you that it was pretty much just escapism. I didn't know what I was doing. I was doing a lot of really unsafe things. I wasn't using them as a tool to be healthy. I was using them to escape from pain. And then it just came to a pressure cooker point where you know, psychedelics saved my life. Part of the reason I decided to make a film was that I'm genuinely interested in this stuff. And I think that it helps people. Frequently, because some of my friends know that I'm interested in this, they will come to me or they will encourage other people to come to me with questions and their problems and seeking help. So I thought a film about psychedelic medicine that kind of breaks down all of this stuff that you see in the news and just makes it more digestible for the average viewer would be really helpful. You know, when I was the black sheep highly stigmatized, I was reading, I was absorbing. And although my mind wasn't prepared to receive the message, the seeds were being planted in my mind. Really what started to inspire it, my acceptance of psychedelic as medicine, was really the brave people that set the path for me.